This is the Latin American Revolutions notes from class. So the first thing we want to remember is our map of South America when everything was still colonies. Okay, remember that um, the Spanish control everything that's yellow. They had New Spain up in the north, which becomes Mexico, um, and all the way down to Panama, and that becomes part of New Granada, including Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. And then you have Peru um, out to on the western coast, and uh, Buenos Aires or La Plata down at the south. And then uh, Portugal has the Brazil. But remember that um, the end of the Amazon River is mainly jungle and mountains, and so it hasn't really been explored. Nobody really lives there at this point except the indigenous tribes, so most of the Portuguese are up on the coast um, by Rio de Janeiro and where they've created their plantations. Cuba is Spanish, Jamaica is British, um, Santo Domingo, which will become f uh, Haiti, is French, and Santo Domingo, which is Spanish, will become the Dominican Republic. Um, so this is kind of how things are set up. And then we have our little tiny United States of America at this point. Okay, so, so how do the s Europeans set everything up politically? They're going to make sure that the colonial governments mirror the mother country's government. So if the mother country has a very strict structure of government, then the colony is going to as well. So for example, in Spain, Spain has one king and queen, and then has regional governors that help govern, and so just similarly to that, um, the king or queen of Spain is going to be in charge, and they're going to send uh, governors that they call viceroys over to the colonies. So you have the viceroyalities, so you'll have a viceroy of New Spain, a viceroy of New Granada, vice, no, viceroy of Peru, viceroy of La Plata, etc. Um, now, most of the conquistadors, after they conquer the whole area, are going to be given government positions and become known as viceroys. Um, they become the original governors, and then later on it will either pass down in their family, or um, a new person will get sent over from Spain. Now, we're gonna, also going to see a huge influence of Catholicism. Remember, one of our motives was God, okay, trying to convert to all of these heathen natives into good practicing Catholics. And so the missionaries had come over and done a lot with that, and then we're going to see them followed by priests coming to convert all of the natives to Catholicism as well. Economically, Latin America is going to be mercantilist, okay, in terms of their economies. Um, the colonies are existing to increase the wealth of the mother country. Because wealth equals power, the mother countries, i.e. Spain and Portugal, want their colonies to make as much money for them as possible. So they're going to be looking for some raw materials like gold and silver, also mahogany, um, which is a wood, and apparently spelled wrong. They're also going to see a lot of farming for profit. They're going to start farming sugar in the tropical areas and cocoa. Um, they're also going to farm corn in Peru and potatoes, as well as uh, up in New Spain. But the main two pro products are going to be sugar and cocoa. And remember that when you farm a crop for product, they become known as cash crops. So sugar and cocoa are cash crops. And then when the encomienda system, where they enslaved all the natives, failed, they're going to move towards enslaving African slaves or Africans to keep this structure going. Now, in order to keep this structure going, they institute a very rigid social structure. Okay, so you are born into one of the classes and you will remain in one of those classes because it's all based on race. Um, and believe it or not, they had they believed that you couldn't change race. So the Peninsulares are at the top. They are born in Europe. They take the long voyage across the Atlantic over. Um, they're obviously white European and they're going to hold all of the important military and government jobs. The second class are going to be the Creoles. They are born in the colonies, um, but they're of European descent, which means their parents or their grandparents were from Europe. Um, and they are the second class, so they control most of the land and the businesses. So they're going to be, um, some Creoles are plantation owners, some are large business owners, some are merchants, um, things like that. Our third class are the Mestizos. They're the Native American and European mix. So maybe mom was, Europe was um, Native American and dad was European, or the other way around, which was much more rare. They're the third class in society, and they're usually working for the Peninsulares and the Creoles. Now, not necessarily as slaves, like you would think, but they're working as like the overseers on the plantation, making sure that the slaves are doing what the Creoles or the Peninsulares, the owners, want them to. Okay, and then we have mulattoes, who are the European and African mix. Usually a European father and an African mother, um, a slave mother. Sometimes the mulattoes are still enslaved if, the, if their mother was a slave. 
but if their mother was a free black, then they might be working um, on the docks or working in the mines, um, things like that. Um, hard labor jobs. Okay, so you can see our social structure here, and then um, at the very bottom we have Africans and Native Americans. Those two positions can switch um, depending on the location. So if there are more Native Americans in an area, they're going to be a higher social status than Africans. If there are more Africans, they're going to be a higher social status than the Native Americans. And in order to keep people, to make sure people know what caste they are, they are going to create what are called casta paintings, where you can see, it tells you, you can see the words up at the top, if you have an Espanol and a mulata, you get Morifico babies, okay? So similar to here, where you see an Espanol over on the left, and in India, and you get a Meta looks like Melfica or something, and you can see Mestizo. Okay, and so different areas have different names for their um, castes, as you can see by the Mexican castes, where there are tons of different caste systems um, all in one area, and so Peru would have a different caste system as well. Gets so complicated that eventually it kind of falls apart when nobody's really sure what they are anyways. So, what happens in the colonies? They're making money for the Spanish crown. The Spanish crown takes a fifth of all profit, okay? That's their tax that they use to make sure that to make the wealth. Um, and so, a lot of the Enlightenment ideas spread to Latin America through the pamphlets that get put on boats and taken across the sea. We're also going to hear news of the American and French revolutions, and people start to say, hey, those revolutions worked, okay? And they got rid of the control of England and France, and so maybe we should have some revolutions, maybe we could do that. And our Creoles are going to be playing the largest role because they're the second class. Maybe they want to be the highest class, okay? Maybe they want to be in charge. They're also wealthy and so they can pay for armies and things like that. And they're better educated, okay? A lot of Creoles are going to be sent to Europe to go to university, learn about Enlightenment ideas there, and then bring them back. So we're going to go through the Latin American revolutions in order. Okay, and there are a couple of them, couple of them that we need to know about. First of all is Haiti. Okay, the slaves in Haiti are called or um, on the island of Hispaniola are going to rebel against France. They're going to be led by a former slave named Toussaint Louverture. They're going to end up defeating the French army with the help of malaria because the French soldiers do not have resistance to malaria. And in 1804, they're going to achieve independence. Okay, over here in our picture is Toussaint Louverture. Okay, now, rebel against France, led by Napoleon. So this is when Napoleon says, hey, this whole western part of the world thing not working out. I think we're going to get rid of that whole little piece of land called Louisiana and sell it to the Americans. After Haiti gains independence, Mexico is going to come along and say, aha, independence, great idea. Okay, a priest by the name of Miguel Hidalgo um, believes in Enlightenment ideas and is going to issue a call for independence. And so he starts by raising a army of Indians and Mestizos and leading them in the march towards independence against the Peninsulares, but then they're going to be defeated by the Creoles. And I want you to stop the video for a second and think about why. Why do you think the Creoles were willing to defeat the Mestizos? Think about the social structure in the colonies. Why would the Creoles feel threatened by the Mestizos? Well, because if the Mestizos win, the Indians and Mestizos, then the Creoles are still second class, and the Indians and the Mestizos might become the first class. And so the Creoles have lost power. So it's all about maintaining power. And on your notes, okay, you have a little box up on the corner where it says, what do you see in this picture? Here's the picture. Okay, so take a second to stop the video and write down and answer the questions on the side. What do you think is happening? Who is involved? And why do you think they are doing this? This picture sometimes shows up on the SOLs. So eventually, 10 years later, after Miguel Hidalgo's independence movement had been put down, the Creoles decide that, yeah, we kind of want like this whole independence idea as well. And so the Creoles unite and raise an army. Um, they fear a loss of power. Some, some of the peninsulares had become kind of liberal, okay, and not their traditional conservative, no change kind of thing. Um, and so these liberal leaders were going to give away Creole land to the mestizos and so forth. And so they don't really like that, and they're going to fight for power um, and end up with independence. And so independence is proclaimed in 1821. And Mexico originally is this entire green area that you see on the map. 
the southern part will eventually fall off and become the United Provinces of Central America, and 20 years later, the United States will take over part of this country as well. Okay. Now, Brazil is a Portuguese colony. Um, it was a bloodless revolution. Prince Pedro was the son of the King of Portugal, and the King of Portugal decided that it was too tough to rule Brazil from Portugal, and so he basically gave his son um, the country when the Creoles start to demand independence, and so Prince Pedro becomes the new king of Brazil as they create a new monarchy. And here you see Prince Pedro up on his horse being saluted for declaring independence for Brazil in 1822. Colombia and Venezuela are going to declare independence from Spain in 1811, which starts the South American Wars of Independence. They're going to be led by Simon Bolivar, who is Venezuelan. He is a Creole, and he is a general. He went to Europe to study at the universities, learned some Enlightenment ideas, and came back um, and started declaring from independence. And in class, we're going to read some excerpts um, from a speech that he gave. So what happens is, during the Wars of Independence, uh, it takes 10 years, okay, it's kind of a guerrilla warfare style fighting. Eventually they will march into Colombia from Venezuela um, and win victory over all of the Spanish forces and gain independence. And they form a new country called Gran Colombia in 1824, and you can see it um, in the yellow over on the map. Eventually it will split into Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. And then in the south of South America, um, Chile, Argentina, Peru, and Bolivia are going to be freed by a guy named Jose San Martin. He is a general who is going to lead an army of Creoles. They free Argentina first, and then they march west into Chile and free Chile and Santiago from the Spanish. And then they eventually march up to Peru, um, join with Simon Bolivar in Peru, and then free B Peru and Bolivia. So, by this point, by 1825, almost all of um, South America, Latin America, are free, as you can see by this map. So, Gran Colombia splits um, in the 1830s, and we have all of our countries except for um, the Guianas, which are owned by the Dutch and the British. So, when the U.S. sees all of this happening... There, in 1823, President James Monroe is going to issue the Monroe Doctrine, which says that the Latin American nations are independent. So he's essentially reaffirming that, yes, they just won their battles, and that's, that's a good thing. And he says, European nations cannot control any independent state in the Western Hemisphere, which means that he's saying Spain and France and, and, and Portugal can't come back over to the Western Hemisphere and try and take their colonies back. It's cut off. It's forbidden. Okay? So you've got to leave them alone. You can trade with them, but you can't come back and try to politically gain, regain control of them and make them their colonies again. So you can see in the picture how Uncle Sam's kind of standing guard with the Monroe Doctrine over the Western Hemisphere, keeping those Europeans on the Eastern Hemisphere. Now, some other pictures that you may see. Okay, you can see Uncle Sam kind of pointing out the Monroe Doctrine line to the British and the Germans, saying, don't you dare come over here. And then on the right, Uncle Sam with his big baseball bat of the Monroe Doctrine kind of protecting South America and North America against any European invaders that might try and come in. Um, and then the most clear picture, I think, is this kind of like stop sign with the line essentially creating a wall in the um, Atlantic Ocean around. And Europe's kind of saying, what do you mean by off limits? Okay, yes, you can trade with them, but no, you can't try and take it over. And so eventually we get to South America that we know today and the countries that you had to learn. And that's the end of this part of the notes.